Dear students, I, I like to begin my lectures with a joke. I like uh, uh, these American uh, lectures, but this time around, actually, I save the joke for the end. So I, po I apologize for that. And please have patience, and uh, it will be funny uh, at the end. Okay. So uh, uh, I tried also to make my... Uh, um, a little sexy, as, as Giovanni put it to me when he demanded me to, to make an interesting title. So, uh, in the first line of the title, you see that actually I quoted uh, many people in the Western Balkans who, when they speak about the possibility of their countries to become uh, EU member states, they say, ironically, uh, they, meaning the EU, they want to uh, they pretend to want us in, and we pretend to reform. This is a very often phrase that you can uh, hear now in, in the Western Balkans. But let us begin from the beginning. Um, you see here on, on the map, actually, the, the larger map of the of the Balkans or Southeast Europe. And uh, it's, it's not only the Western Balkans that it is presented here. Uh, you see here uh, uh, also other Southeast European states like Turkey, Greece, Bulgaria, Romania, et cetera, et cetera. We can go a little down, please, now. So for those of you who are not familiar with the term, okay, that's enough. Ah, excellent. Uh, with the term Western Balkans, actually it comes from uh, the territory or from the states now, uh, made up or uh, established after former Yugoslavia disappeared in 1991, but minus Slovenia and Croatia. Uh, so Slovenia and Croatia were two out of six uh, republics of former Yugoslavia, and now they do not belong in the usual understanding of the word, of the, of the phrase Western Balkans, they do not belong to the region. But we add to these ex-Yugoslav states Albania. And there is another way to say Western Balkans or the region. It is Western Balkans 6. This is the usual way how the EU in its uh, boring uh, documents and, and long speeches, how they refer to us from the Western Balkans. Why is that so? Uh, why six? Why not six countries? Well, look at the country in the middle, Kosovo, that has an asterisk. Uh, this is how... Uh, this uh, word is has been uh, written for many years now. Kosovo seceded from uh, Serbia in 2008. So, what's that? 13 years uh, ago. But had been recognized by many states, probably half of the, a little less than half of the states in the world. Serbia itself, which has not recognized uh, the sovereignty and the independence of Kosovo. Uh, Russia, China, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But most importantly for uh, for the EU, five uh, uh, states, member states of the EU, have not recognized Kosovo as as a new independent and sovereign state. Can someone from the audience tell me? Can you guess what these five EU member states are? The non recognizers of Kosovo. I don't know. Is there a way to to be a little more interactive, Giovanni? Yeah. yeah yes, there is. Maybe maybe they can use it in the chat, for example. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so guess which countries? <clears throat> One is Spain. One is Spain. Exactly. Yeah. And the same reason, the fear from secession of one region. Catalonia in, in Spain and other uh, regions in other states. This is the fear that actually in many states made their governments determined not to recognize Kosovo. But what, uh, what other states do have a similar problem, like an issue, let's say, in this stupid American way, not a problem, but an issue uh, with, the, uh, with their regions. Uh, regions that would like to maybe secede from the country. What are these Euro EU countries? Chat. Let's see. Uh -huh. 
Are yes. we waiting for? Yes. So Vasily okay. says Romania. <clears throat> exactly. So there are several hundred thousand ethnic Hungarians in Romania. That Romania is afraid uh, that they might ask for for independence. So this is number two. Spain, Romania. Let's go further. Let's go down uh, to the south of Europe. Let's go ahead. Yes, Matthias says Bulgaria. <coughs> no, <laughs> that's not correct. But Greece and Cyprus, I have to hurry because I have a lot of many things. Greece and Cyprus. Uh, <coughs> and last but not least, can you guess what is the fifth state that hasn't recognized? So this is a big step, you know, that they, they differ from the EU Kosovo policy. They conform to this, to the general principles. And uh, as long as these five not recognizers actually uh, do not want to, to uh, recognize Kosovo, um, Serbia can be actually, can um, uh, be in, in, in the, uh, I would say, in the good zone. It doesn't have to, in, in a way, uh, if, <laughs> If it doesn't want to enter the EU, it 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 can be comfortable with its own decision not to recognize uh, its once its its, its uh, uh, autonomous province. Okay, so we go on. So this is why. And can you? No, you cannot see. So I I make circles now, but it's only for me. So West of Balkan six: Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kosovo, Montenegro, North Macedonia, and and Serbia. And this is a very complicated re uh, region, uh, difficult to understand. So don't be, um, how to say, embarrassed if you don't know anything about it, or if you need to learn quite a lot about it. I'm here to fill the gaps for you today. The the, the name itself, uh, Western Balkans, is invented by the EU actually in the 90s. It's a group of countries that were either in military conflicts. Uh, after the, um, the disintegration of Yugoslavia, which happened in 1991. Conflicts lasted practically a whole decade until the year 2000, uh, ending, ending with, the, with the NATO intervention, the first NATO intervention out of area. This is the NATO jargon um, against Serbia and Montenegro because of gross human rights violations and, and uh, violence uh, uh, that Serbia did Serbian uh, military forces uh, in in Kosovo, so quite uh, an exciting and horrible, horrible decade. One hundred thousand people dead, several million of people in former Yugoslavia evicted from their homes. Many of them live in in, uh, in many European and other countries. I see many. I see now um, names of uh, people come who came or their parents came from the Balkans here. So, uh, uh, the EU invented the term for a group of countries that was consumed by military conflicts. Uh, and that was, uh, how to say, very complicated and least prepared for the EU succession, also economically underdeveloped. And in 2003, when conflicts finally ended, uh, the EU promised at the Thessaloniki summit in, in Greece, uh, promised uh, EU membership to Western Balkan countries. Uh, of course, once they meet the necessary official criteria for, for accession. Uh, but accession has been too long and inefficient, especially if we compare this, this long and inefficient uh, uh, accession with the one uh, that Central European countries or even other Western European countries went through uh, in their times. Uh, let me remind you, of, I, I missed now something happened. The, the presentation went away and, and I didn't touch anything. Yes, don't worry, it is coming. Yes, so uh, let me just uh, see how uh, this approach to the Western Balkans by the EU is different, actually, from its approach uh, to the so-called uh, to, to other uh, ex-communist countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union. In their case, 
there has not been a, a promise, a stamp, if you want, on the paper by the EU that they would join the EU one day when they, they are. So the difference between I don't know, Serbia or, or Macedon, North Macedonia and uh, I don't know, let's say uh, Moldova is uh, that, uh, like, or Ukraine, uh, is that uh, Moldova and Ukraine have never been uh, made promises by the, uh, by the EU about the possible accession to the EU. Now, we, I continue here. I hope you, you can see the presentation too. Let, let's stop here. So, uh, uh, we can say now with a lot, lot of bitter experience and, and, uh, and, and, and bitter experience, I don't want to, to use uh, harsher words, in the Western Balkans, that after a decade long crisis within the EU enlargement policy, the most important part actually of the EU foreign policy, if you want, the enlargement to the Western Balkans and Turkey, we are in the same category to some extent, it has practically stopped now. And everybody is actually, we are competing now to describe this death of EU enlargement in many colorful uh, ways. And I don't want to, to go into that. And uh, for the first time now, during the last couple of years, uh, people in the Western Balkans and also in the EU, uh, observers, experts, they openly, they openly suggest that the EU accession of these countries might never happen. So we might uh, forever stay in the status of limbo somehow, uh, between a rock and, and a hard place, as, as the Americans uh, would say. Despite that, and this is what I wanted to somehow uh, how to say to emphasize uh, in my title, enlargement officially continues. So there are uh, negotiating teams, there are plans, uh, there are people uh, who are engaged in the negotiations. Uh, quite a lot of paper has been, you know, uh, spent, wasted for that. And both sides, both the EU and the Western Balkans, they pretend they're doing something, you know, while we are standing actually, while we're not moving at all. So this is why I say they pretend to want us in and we pretend to be doing something about it. Let's go to the next page, please. So a few other things that are important as, as part of some general explanation or general uh, uh, elements of, of the whole uh, context that we are going to explore. So uh, the uh, somehow in, in this negative during this negative process of stopping EU enlargement in the Western Balkans, the only EU enlargement that exists now, in uh, in addition to Turkey, Turkey by the way, its own uh, uh, way or accession to the EU was stopped four years ago. And there is no way I think they can move on. Uh, and there is now uh, a consensus, I would say, on both sides, on the Turkish one and on the EU one, that Turkey will never get into the EU. I hope this doesn't count for, for the Balkans. So now we see that expected EU roles, and there were quite a lot of expectations actually, its own credibility and uh, its transformative power. This is the usual phrase used for the EU, in the region, they are greatly reduced. If you compare all these three things today with the situation in 2010 or, or 9, it is very, very much different. We went from bad to worse, I would say. In addition to that, the other leg of the westernization of the Western Balkan, uh, by the way, there is no Eastern Balkan. Nobody speaks about the Eastern Balkan. I would say that Bulgaria and Romania would be there, but nobody likes to be in the East. So they are not named as, as a group. You, the US is nowhere to be seen in the region. It used to be decisively important at the end of the, of the 1990s because of its NATO intervention, which stopped the wars, the killing, the horror. And then little by little, they actually moved. The, the, their preferences were on many other sides of the world. There was an attempt a year ago by Trump, well, he's 
was still was in the office to come back to the Balkans, but that is, uh, we don't, we can't expect actually um, an enlarged role of the US in the Balkans, which would help, by the way, EU ex uh, accession also, because the US has always said very openly and directly that uh, they support Western Balkan countries in their way towards the EU membership. This was somehow uh, a common stance, a concerted effort, as they say, between the EU and, and, and the US. And at the same time, and you will see uh, several pages about that uh, in 20 to, to 30 minutes from now, uh, the EU competitors, external actors that are more or less hostile or not friendly, at least they are competitive vis-a-vis -vis the EU, Russia, China, Turkey, etc. They are rising, actually. Their power, their, uh, uh, how to say, credibility, uh, it, it's, it's on uh, the rise uh, in, in the Western Balkans, together with the fall of the credibility and popularity of the EU. So there is a kind of a, a zero-sum game. But <clears throat> taking them into account, and we, we can still say very, very uh, confidently that the European Union is still by far the most important external actor. Why? Three reasons that I will explore uh, in, uh, in, in the minutes to come. First, all Western Balkan countries, despite disappointments, despite whatever happened and, and, and uh, lack of successes in the EU integration, they still want to become EU member states. There are high expectations from the EU. There were expectations from the EU, not only from ex-communist countries, but from countries like Ireland, for example, once Greece or, or Portugal. So uh, underdeveloped countries that expected actually to progress a, a lot uh, and in any, any possible way uh, with the EU membership card. And uh, uh, last but not least, and differently from these, uh, from the cases of countries that I've just mentioned, uh, the EU has been involved in much, in many more uh, actions, activities uh, in the Western Balkans than in any other reason, uh, region uh, before. Okay, let's go a little down so we can see the, the map. Here's the map again. And uh, you can see here, so there are, uh, this is the, the map that presents uh, how the uh, Southeast Europe, the Balkans, is progressing towards the Brussels Gate, as we call it. So, uh, on, on, on the e in the east, uh, Turkey, with, in green, uh, you see uh, the, the number 2005, like all other numbers. These are numbers when accession negotiations with the EU began. So, uh, Greece, uh, sorry, Turkey began in 2005, together with Croatia, that managed to become the EU member in 2013. I'm sorry I cannot now point to all those small and uh, uh, small countries. I don't want to say anything bad. And then you see uh, uh, two other green countries, one 2014 and the other 2012. These are Serbia and Montenegro that began their accession negotiations in those years presented on the map. Then we have yellow countries, uh, 2014, 2005, Albania and North Macedonia. North Macedonia, can you imagine? This is the biggest disgrace that the EU has ever done. Okay, there were many, but this is one of them. They, they uh, made Macedonia at that time, now North Macedonia. They changed the name three years ago. Uh, a candidate for the EU uh, in 2005, my, my, Math is, is very bad, so I cannot even say how many years uh, ago. It was 16 years ago. Nobody in the history of EU integration has waited more uh, to, to begin, not to end, mind you, to begin accession negotiations, no, no, but uh, then Macedonia, North Macedonia. So uh, Albania joined as EU candidate, as it, it got candidate status. Seven years ago. Then we have uh, orange country, which is Bosnia and, and Herzegovina, 2016. 
they are not even near uh, the previously mentioned countries because they are not uh, candidates, they are potential candidates. For, <laughs> I'm sorry, it is, it is actually ridiculous, all, all of this thing. Uh, so, they, the, Bosnia only managed to apply officially for the uh, EU membership in 2016, five years ago. It, it still has to wait to become a candidate and then to wait to, to begin accession negotiations and then to wait decades probably to maybe uh, maybe not to become a new member kosovo it's in in an even worse uh, situation uh, unrecognized uh, with so many problems the only from the western balkans whose citizens still have to get a schengen visa if they go to any of the schengen countries all others are um, don't have to do that for 11 years now. 12, 12. Uh, they didn't even um, apply for membership. So their journey towards the Brussels gate is so long that actually you can't see the end. And let's go to the next uh, page or, or part of the page, please. Yes, once again, so thank you. Uh, we'll stop here once again. Uh, another last look at, at the region uh, from the statistical point of view. You see how the whole region, it has only 18 million inhabitants now. And it's very poor. For example, a very small country that wasn't mentioned as one of the non-recognizers in Kosovo by you, uh, Slovakia. Uh, uh, so Slovakia has a GDP, uh, not per capita, but GDP equal to the combined GDPs of all those six countries. So you, you can imagine it. Greece, for example, which was bankrupt several years ago and has this incredible uh, debt of, I don't know, 360 billion <coughs> uh, euros. Greece's GDP is much higher actually than the combined total GDP of all these countries. And in terms of the population, you see in this region, Serbia is <laughs> known for being the biggest one with only 7 million um, inhabitants. So many uh, Italian regions actually have more inhabitants than, than Serbia. Um, the, the smallest one on, on the left side, Montenegro, only 600,000 uh, inhabitants. And then all the other in the, uh, in the middle. Let's go down a little to the next uh, picture. So one of the advantages actually of the region is that it is surrounded by EU members. It is now a white spot or I don't know, a gray spot, whatever that's called in the, in the literature. As you can see here, going from the left to the, from the east to the, uh, to the west. So Italy, Italy is also practically a, a neighbor uh, across the Adriatic Sea. Uh, Italy, Slovenia, Croatia, I'm going to, to, the, to the west, to the right side of the picture. Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Greece, all the, these countries are, have been members of the EU for uh, longer or, or shorter period of time. I'll show you the periods now. It's, very, it's, it's a part of the story that is interesting. But also these all are actually part of, uh, of NATO. And... <clears throat> and this is uh, news from a few years ago, recent news in, in the Western Balkans. We also got, contrary to Russia's intentions and uh, many activities, some of them uh, clandestine, we also got two NATO members in the region, which is Montenegro, if you can find it here somehow, uh, and Macedonia Montenegro got NATO membership card in 2017, and North Macedonia in 2020, last year, a year and a half ago. <clears throat> they all hoped actually to be somehow protected by NATO, but also as in other cases of, um, of Eastern um, ex-communist, Eastern European ex-communist countries, uh, NATO membership was the first step actually, and an important step towards the EU membership. Okay, let's go down. Now there is a table. <clears throat> uh, just a little more, let's see Kosovo at the bottom. Okay, uh, a little more. Okay, so these are 
<clears throat> years in which uh, uh, Balkan, in, in the wider sense, Southeast European actually countries got into the EU and NATO. The first column is EU, the other is NATO. If you see, I put Greece and Turkey uh, in the first place because they are the oldest NATO members in the region. 1952, so it's only three years after NATO was made. This was, in my humble opinion, the most important, uh, ingenious decision that NATO has ever made by getting two countries that were in constant conflicts. Uh, there was fear of wars, actually, in, in Southern Europe. Getting them, putting them together, you know, in a package into NATO, prevented wars, prevented serious conflicts in, in, in South Europe. I never miss the opportunity when I speak with the people from NATO, EU, etc., to say, hey, can you at least, you know, for at least for some time, act like NATO did in 1952, you know, think, you know, long term, think strategically. This is why Western Balkans could be, should be, or, or part of it uh, made uh, uh, EU members now, you know, because there will be more troubles in future if it if it's not allowed to, to enter, I don't know, in, in the next decade or so. Or so. And then we have uh, three countries, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, Slovenia. Uh, all of them, they became NATO members in 2004. Uh, Slovenia joined one of uh, uh, six ex-Yugoslav republics. It was the first to join the EU in 2004 uh, during the first enlargement wave uh, after uh, 1989, after the fall of, of the uh, Berlin. Uh, then Croatia, it got into NATO in 2009 together with Albania, which I didn't mention uh, two minutes ago. Uh, so 2009, these are two, uh, two uh, important countries that entered NATO in 2001, followed by, uh, I repeat, Montenegro in 2017 and then North Macedonia in 2020. Croatia made it as the last country which was uh, which, which uh, entered the EU in 2013. Since then, so for the last eight years, nobody else actually uh, came in, uh, in uh, neither from the Western Balkans or from any other part of, of Europe. And we said enough for, uh, for this. Uh, the, the only uh, interesting uh, thing about Serbia is actually that it is the only neutral country it turned neutral uh, in a strange and, and uh, bad way by only a, a parliament resolution, not by law, not by constitution, um, making it a favor to Russia. So Serbia's neutrality, in my opinion, and I, I wrote about it also, is, uh, is a, a good help for Russia to, to, for its own priority to stop NATO enlargement in Europe. This was important. So now uh, it's, uh, you know, sometimes Serbia could become a NATO member, but uh, it is not neutral in the same way. I, I can't go into that as Austria or Finland or Sweden, etc. Let's go down. So in my way, <coughs> in my understanding, actually, there are two images of the European Union in the Western Balkans. One is the pre-crisis image, and I use plural here. Uh, intentionally, uh, because uh, crises have been, in, in plural, have been haunting both the EU and the Western Balkans during the last, uh, I don't know, 10, 11, 12 years. Uh, and there is another image, this is the, uh, sorry, this is the pre-crisis pre image until the beginning of the last uh, decade, and then there is a, the, the crisis image since, let's say, 2010. And the pre-crisis image of the EU actually consists of three things that complement uh, each other. The first part of the image is that the EU is a fixer. The, the second is that EU is anchor and role model. The third is uh, the EU is ATM, so cash machine. So in other words, uh, the EU is at the same time, all the people from Western Balkans, but I would say, 
we share this this image with all other underdeveloped uh, uh, countries that in this or that decade in the past joined the EU. So it is uh, for us the EU is an indispensable problem solver. It is an anchor and role model for reforms, and it is at the same time instrument of development and, and modernization. Let's go down, please. So we'll see now in more detail each of these three parts or elements of the pre-crisis image of the EU. So EU as a fixer. Uh, this comes actually from the fact that local elites are either unwilling or incapable or both to deal alone with many problems they face. Uh, look at the problem. So difficult legacy in the region, unlike in any other part of Europe. So we had wars. These were real, real wars uh, that stopped only you know, two decades ago. And the consequences of which are, can be still seen, not only in the buildings and in the people who now live uh, uh, who knows uh, where, because they left uh, the war zone, but the, there is a high conflict potential in the region, you know, and uh, it, it, it only needs, you know, uh, a small effort by bad guys, and they're all bad guys are all over the terrain in, in the region, to, you know, to instigate a new conflict. Maybe not the war, because we are now controlled by NATO and by EU, etc. Uh, but, uh, you know, some people might be hurt by this, many people might be hurt by these conflicts. We have, we still have ethnic conflicts. We still have, we are still economically the most underdeveloped region in Europe. And we have weak states, not strong enough in the meaning that uh, these states of ours cannot deliver public goods, all kinds of public goods. The most important problems now uh, in comparison with, I don't know, 15 years ago, Democracy and rule of law. So can you imagine actually, but you can, there is a process of autocratization in the whole world. Well, America under Trump, the US actually got much less democratic and much more autocratic. The same uh, we see in, in Europe, especially in, in uh, very unfamous, notorious countries for these uh, reasons, Poland and Hungary now, which turned authoritarian in, in many ways. The same thing happens actually is happening in, in the Western Balkans, where the roots of consolidated democracy don't exist or are very thin. And they cannot actually support the democracy building, you know, above. We have state capture, which means that the state, the institutions uh, are captured by private interests. By the way, please, um, Interrupt me whenever you have a question or a comment. Uh, the the level of corruption and organized crime. So mean it means crime where uh, politicians, you know, the, the the political elite is included. It, this level is very high. We have had, uh, uh, fortunately, not now in, in that uh, serious sense, economic crisis, and there is a spirit of intolerance uh, in the region. There are many specific problems, for example, status of Kosovo. So Serbia does, with the help of, of Russia in the uh, United Nations Security Council, it does not want to, to recognize Kosovo, which is always done, as I said, by five other EU member states. Uh, and there are other uh, issues, Ma Macedonia, North Macedonia had this name issue or problem with Greece. Uh, Greece didn't want to, to recognize it, and then there was a consensus that this country used to be called until three, four years ago, uh, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, FIROM, uh, shortened. Uh, luckily, there were two brave politicians, both prime ministers in the Republic of Macedonia at that time, Zaev and in Greece, uh, Tsipras, who actually went ahead and without practically any pressure or help from the EU or elsewhere, they made a deal, uh, according to which uh, they became friends again, became 
began to cooperate more. And for that, uh, one of the compromises that North Macedonia had to, had to give was actually to change the name, which is an incredibly high price, you know, that this country paid. You know, it, this was welcomed very badly by uh, good parts of, of population. And uh, they made it actually, I'm uh, going into details to show you the following thing. Zaev, uh, Prime Minister of Macedonia, did this, pressured uh, 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 the population because he counted on the EU to respond in the only possible, in the only decent way to take Macedonia from the status of a candidate since 2005 to, uh, for Macedonia to begin finally accession negotiations. This didn't happen. This is the point that this is how the EU works. And this poor guy, he's not poor, by the way, but he's poor in, in a spiritual sense. Zoran Zaev uh, resigned two weeks ago in, in, in Macedonia. And I, I will now say openly, he resigned because of the EU. He made sacrifices. He made uh, a very unpopular choice. And the EU did not respond, uh, how to say, uh, in, 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 an, in, uh, in a good way to that. Okay, uh, the, another thing that is important, it's that EU, the EU is engaged, has been engaged in non-standard areas in the region. So it's not only about the acquis communautaire, uh, we are actually, uh, we have to take care about acquis plus, this is how I say. So there are many other things our countries have to do because of the, of the uh, conflicts in, in the 90s. And this is why, as you can see here, the EU has been engaged in security in the region, which it doesn't do practically. It now, it's now planning actually to do something for the second, five, fifth time. And it, it also engages in improving, fixing inter-ethnic relations and also in internal political crisis. You know, this is, you can imagine actually the, uh, this situation if you, if you see children, you know, playing somewhere. These are uh, Western Balkan states and then they quarrel and, and maybe even beat, uh, uh, they, they go get into fight. And then one of them goes to, to one parent, which is the EU. And, they, and he, he or she says, he did this to me, take care of him. This is how uh, Western Balkan political elites behave. So they, they don't want to take responsibility. They go to the EU to fix the problem. This is why I call that part of the EU image uh, the, the fixer part. And there, there are bitter consequences, of course, because if you behave like a child, and you do actually, these people do, then there is, in my opinion, a systemic or systematic eradication of local accountability or ownership. So you can always say, Ah, oh, you know, we did this because the EU told us to do, or you, we didn't this because the EU would prevent us to do. You never, you know, politicians do, uh, do not behave in the way in which you see that they uh, hold themselves accountable to their voters. Okay, let's go to number two. Yes, but could you provide some examples of this? Uh, many, many examples, I would say. Uh, I can't think of any uh, specific now, uh, maybe during the lecture, I, I'll come to that again, because I like to criticize uh, Western Balkan uh, politicians. Uh, you know, they are, I, let, let's, let me put it this way, they are in, in, in a way uh, uh, accountable in, in two ways. One way, and it, this comes with elections, because believe it or not, we have elections in the Western Balkans. Uh, when there are elections, actually, they are voted by their own people. Tomorrow, you know, the day after elections, you know, they turn their heads towards Brussels and they're not interested in, in their voters or in the population. So this is how things are made. And then there, there, there are deals. Uh, they are uh, one of the, of the terms that we use for our politicians is actually that they are gatekeepers. They actually, you know, allow for some information or requirements to come from the EU and uh, 
then they filter them somehow, you know, and then let us see that because who reads uh, the EU website uh, in, a, in addition to you and, and me, Giovanni? Nobody actually. This is the most boring literature you can imagine, you know, and, and people are, can be told everything, you know, through television. Uh, so gatekeepers uh, also, and then, you know, they make deals with the, with the, the EU. You know, if I do that, you know, for example, one of the deals is do not criticize, and this is a topical thing now, if you read uh, Western European newspapers, politico.eu is, is very good to, to read. Uh, it, uh, it is free also. <laughs> Hello, Politico. It's, it was bought recently by the biggest German publishing company, by the way. Uh, there is a, a story going on there about the uh, European Commissioner for Neighborhood and Enlargement, Oliver Varche, a uh, former minister and, and uh, good collaborator of the non-democratic Hungarian Prime Minister uh, Viktor Orban, who is very favorable to, to Serbia and to Serbian authoritarian President uh, uh, Alexander Vucic. So he was accused, this is what uh, the journalists were writing, by his uh, colleagues from the office uh, that actually he was favorable and he was trying to change, to improve the reports, the EU reports about Serbia. <clears throat> In, you know, the, the other side of the, of the coin is Vucic can do, you know, can improve stability in the Balkans. Uh, if you uh, follow my presentation, I will mention this phenomenon when the EU relied on authoritarian politicians in the Western Balkans to keep things stable. But you cannot actually uh, believe that authoritarian uh, leadership, even in, in, in the Western Balkans, can work in that way for a long time. In the literature, this is a phenomenon called now, um, I'm sorry, I'm 64 years old, uh, stabilitocracy. So it, it's a very good term. So uh, this is a trade done by the EU. Uh, let let me let us give uh, give us you Western Balkan leaders give us the sense of stability. So you won't fight again, and we'll leave you alone when it comes to to democracy and rule of law, which are in terrible state in the Western Balkans. I'll mention stabilitocracy again. But uh, how is the EU an anchor and role model? So this is the second part of the EU image, the pre-crisis one. Well, it's an anchor for reform because it gives suggestions and incentives for reforms through a very, uh, for us, the most important EU policy. Uh, it is the EU conditionality policy. So out of one sentence, so one and a half sentence of criteria for uh, new EU members that were defined almost 20 years ago, uh, we now have a very developed, complex uh, EU conditionality policy that deals actually with every single aspect of political, economic, social life in the country. And this is reflected in the, uh, in the uh, reports the EU publishes once a year. The last one on the Western Balkans and on Turkey, because these are the only uh, countries in the package, in the enlargement package now. Uh, these, the, the last uh, reports were published uh, in October, in mid-October. So you can read this if you don't have anything else to do. And uh, another thing is that uh, within the countries, the EU is a kind of political ally for reforms. You, know, you can rely on it, that it will help. Don't ask Zaev about it because they didn't help him, they ruined him uh, once you are in trouble as a politician. And also, you know, within this part of the image, the EU is a, a model to emulate. So you, you have to behave in a European way and to follow, to introduce European values. Interestingly enough, I always quote this, there was a document signed, a bilateral document of Serbia and Montenegro signed in 2003 to uh, the so-called Belgrade Declaration that actually <coughs> regulated the future contours, uh, 
constitutional contours of Serbia-Montenegro relations. In 2003, one year later, a confederation was made between two states. But in this original initial document, uh, Serbia and Montenegro quoted without any hesitation uh, the, uh, the main aims uh, uh, of the EU. So they wanted to copy, to emulate actually the EU in their own uh, states and in their relations. So the, the document mentions explicitly that the EU is for Serbia and Montenegro 20 years ago, the aim, the standard, the guarantor explicitly, the monitor and the arbiter. There is no document in, in the history of the EU that is so humble actually <laughs> as this one, but it shows how much, you know, belief and, and importance uh, Serbia and Montenegro gave at that time to the, to the EU. Last but not least, this is number three, the third part of the um, uh, pre-crisis image of the EU. This is, uh, you know, EU as a cash machine or in uh, nicer words, an instrument of development and modernization for, for people in underdeveloped countries, the EU is always seen as El Dorado. So it supports, it supports the underdeveloped members and makes rich and generally better life possible. And this is what was the expectation of ex-communist countries. This is the same uh, 20 years ago. This is the same expectation uh, that uh, came out many times, became uh, obvious in, in the Western Balkans, and it didn't happen. So we are, as, as you will see, far behind in economic terms uh, from the, let's go to the next uh, page, please. So now the crisis image. In the meantime, you know, during the last decade or so, uh, there was, there, uh, I, I call this the serious three D's uh, event, disappointment, disillusionment, and disenchantment with the EU in the Western Balkans. This all has intervened in the EU image and made, made it worse during the last several years. So why? Because EU lost its magnetism. It really acted like a magnet for the countries because of its own multiple crises that were obvious to all people, not only in the EU, but also to us uh, externally. And because it showed that the EU is not able to resolve this crisis and it had spillover effects in the Western Balkans because we are connected with the EU in so many ways, not only economic, economic ways. It also became clear with new and new criteria that were imposed on us, um, you know, uh, during time, uh, the situation was like this, you know, oh yes, you did good in this uh, part of economic or political relations, but you should also do this. Then we do that, cheating a little or a lot, and then uh, several months later, we get the message, yes, you did that, but you should also pay attention to, to something else. So this is uh, a part of the phenomenon which is called the EU as a moving target. You can never actually uh, get there. But during the last three years or so, actually, it, it became maybe for many people a target impossible to reach. Macron, uh, the French president, actually stopped the EU enlargement in 2018 backed by many other countries that remained silent. For example, there was at, at that time in the, during the first part of the year, um, Bulgaria was at the helm of the EU for six months. And I was there for this uh, <clears throat> big summit of the EU and the Western Balkans. Spain was not represented because Kosovo was present at, at the, at this uh, summit. Can you, I mean, this is a disgrace, you know, to boycott something, a, a good initiative, actually, you know, uh, something like that. Never mind. And, and last but not least, uh, from since the, uh, the beginning of negotiations, uh, with Croatia and, uh, Turkey that began in October of 2005, membership conditions actually were strengthened for the least prepared region. There should be, of course, strict conditions that should be you know, met, 
but to make things uh, much more complicated for the least prepared members, you know, this is somehow very, very strange. And then it, it led not only to the disappointed disappointment within uh, non-EU uh, oriented or, um, people, but within the, the pro-EU circles. Can you, can we go down a little? Okay, that's, that's good. So uh, the pro-EU people would now say the EU is less perfect and less useful for us, and it takes more efforts and more time to obtain its membership than we thought before, if we ever get it, the membership. So the enlargement on its uh, side was evidently, without any doubt, sidelined within the policies of the EU uh, since 2010. It is not a strategic priority uh, of the EU anymore. It stopped, ceased to be this uh, a decade ago. And then there is this stabilitocracy. Uh, EU ceased to be a democracy promoter. So not only an economic helper, but also a democracy promoter. These are two things that uh, underdeveloped countries value much. And it's traded, as I say, such stability uh, with authoritarian leaders for democracy. So we got negative results on both sides and two immediate um, and long lasting uh, uh, policies or, or situations. On one side, you have actually in two, two fatigues, if you want, enlargement fatigue in the EU, and then on the other side, in the Western Balkans, reform fatigue in, in the West. And these two sides, these two processes actually strengthen each other. They complement each other. They work at the same time. And this all, now some uh, statistical data, um, this all actually uh, led to the uh, reduced popularity of the EU in the region. Now, uh, according to, to data that I received yesterday afternoon, uh, these are very optimistic data. They do not correspond with most, uh, much more, how to say, less optimistic public opinion polls done within the countries. This was a regional public opinion poll. They say that uh, around 80% of respondents across the region, in average, in average, would like at this moment their country to join the EU. But Mind you, look at the uh, results for Albania. It's 90%. Albania has no chance of, of getting into the EU in you know, many, many years. And this, was, this is a typical uh, situation. Nations and inhabitants with the least chances to get vastly into the EU have the highest expectations and the biggest illusions uh, about uh, this. Um, other states, you know, like Serbia and Macedonia, Serbia is the most EU, um, how to say, indifferent or uh, uh, country. If you can see here, so only this is, the, <laughs> this would not be true in other public opinion polls. Only 30 or so percent uh, of Serbian respondents said, yes, I was for fu fully for, the, for Serbia to get into EU. Somewhat yes, if, if you add, add this. Uh, with, with this, uh, Serbia goes to a little more than half of the respondents are in favor. Uh, Macedonia, because of the disappointments I described, uh, in, in, in this country, the number of uh, optimistic people uh, about the EU uh, entrance of their country went down also considerably. So there are different situations, um, and uh, one could hardly say, you know, uh, what is the the average result for, for the EU. One could, with certainty, says, say that the EU is not as popular as it used to be. Let's go down, please. Yes, let's stay here with this picture. This is uh, one of the results from a public opinion poll from a year ago. <clears throat> the authors told me recently that the situation went worse. So the, they say here that while EU membership is still popular in the Western Balkans, pessimism prevails regarding fast accession to the EU. And you see uh, under these uh, columns, uh, the, the respondents had several answers at their disposal. 
so my country will be, I expect my country to be in the EU in five years, 10 years, 20 years, or never. The never answer is, is really, uh, how to say, uh, troublesome, because never in the EU was the option chosen by one third of the Serbian uh, respondents, by almost 30% of the ones from Bosnia, by a quarter, so every fourth uh, North Macedonian said the same, his or her country will never get into the EU. And surprisingly, uh, and more soberly than what we saw in, in the picture before, uh, or every fifth Albanian citizen actually said they don't count uh, that their country will ever get into the EU. Let's go down a little. There is another picture here. And I'm sorry I'm talking too much. I will try to finish in 10 minutes or so. Is that okay, Giovanni? Okay. So, but the uh, the personal reasons uh, uh, for getting into the EU have not changed. And these are actually reasons <laughs> that remain important for all uh, incoming uh, uh, inhabitants uh, to, to the EU, for all incoming countries. Uh, the first reason why is it important for someone that his country get into the EU is actually free movement of people. So you can go live and work somewhere else, somewhere else than in your poor and undeveloped country. And you see here, if I can detect uh, three quarters of the cost of our citizens actually said, this is the most important thing because in addition to all other things they share, all other bad things they share with compatriots from other Western Balkan countries, they have to have visas. This is a very big problem <clears throat> to get into the Schengen countries. Or for example, it's, uh, there is a security somewhere. I, the, the picture for me is very small now. Security, this is where the Bosnian citizens, the ones who went, ah, that's better, thank you. Uh, I think, never mind, Bosnia and Kosovo, so the, the two, two countries <clears throat> that went through wars, very, you know, uh, difficult and complicated wars, they actually, you know, opted uh, very much for this option that the EU is important for security, etc., etc. Let's go down, please. Now, uh, one should let, let, let's let uh, a little up a little up uh i have two additional yes th this is okay i have two additional sentences that will discover for you the reality of, of things on the terrain so with all those uh, uh aspirations of individuals concerning the eu you know we have to 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 bear in mind that a quarter of what Western Balkan population emigrated to the EU in the last 20 years. Um, that is a lot. And unfortunately, when you now visit um, new, they are, they are not new, new EU member states, like I did, like I do always uh, every year, except when there is COVID. A uh, few years ago, I was in India and uh, I saw something in Lithuania that I, I haven't seen anywhere in the world. I'm a very active traveler. So noon in, in the uh, Lithuania's capital, no one in the street, in the center of town, no cars, no people because of the even bigger immigration to, to, to other uh, more developed EU countries than before. So we don't expect uh, this uh, immigration wave to be sustained to get smaller uh, once, if ever we get into the EU. And you, uh, let's, I, I show you this, you know, with, uh, with amazement when I, when I found this. Two years ago, before the COVID situation, a quarter of a million of Western Balkan citizens got longer resident status in the EU than three months that we are allowed now to spend during six months. Uh, there, uh, so one Western Balkan citizen uh, 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 wanted, asked for a longer resident status every two minutes in 2009. Let's go down now. And now I'm, I have three uh, pictures about EU competitors 
I mentioned them, they're gaining strength. So this, these pictures actually speak more than, of course, thousand words. This is a very enthusiastic uh, welcome in Belgrade to the visit of uh, Russian President Putin. Comments are welcome, maybe when I finish in, in, in 10 minutes. Let's go to the other uh, picture. So this is a picture about the, the, the rising, oops, stop, let, let's uh, a little up. Yes, that's it. Um, this is a picture that represents a growing Turkish interest and engagement in the region. So Turkish president, especially since 2003, since uh, Erdogan came to power and, and became uh, Turkish president, he's been very interested in regaining Turkish influence within the Western Balkans. And you see him here on one of many, many meetings he has with Western Balkan leaders, especially the ones from Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. He's trying to become uh, a kind of, uh, I'll say, uh, middleman, you know, uh, to in, in, and, and somehow try to, to uh, uh, resolve the, the, the ethnic uh, conflicts between two countries. So you see him here, Erdogan, second from the left, with the Serbian president Vucic on the left, and then with three members of the collective presidency of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, uh, mind you, look at, at the only man who doesn't hold the, the hand of the next to him. This is the Serbian member of the presidency, uh, Milorad Dodik, who has been very active in, in, in uh, plans about secession of his entity, Republika Srpska, from Bosnia now. And he doesn't want, doesn't even want to hold the hand of the representative of the Croats, ethnic Croats in the Bosnian presidency. Okay, let's go down. And the third, okay, the third picture is from March of last year. <clears throat> so a billboard in downtown Belgrade thanking brother C, X-I, or we say C, uh, and this is written in Cyrillic. So one um, Serbian tabloid, or I'd say I call them toilet, toiletoid, uh, actually uh, paid for the billboard to thank the Chinese president for millions of, of vaccines and other medical equipment that Serbia got because of Serbian uh, uh, Chinese or Chinese Serbian friendship uh, before the EU was able and willing to give any help, any medical help. Uh, and then that was a big uh, thing for Serbia. And you see in the back, you know, it, not even um, 007 could do something uh, about it. Daniel Craig was not active. Okay, let's go down. Why are these three countries, at least, okay, okay. Why are these three countries actually regaining or taking uh, the focus of interest, uh, the, the attraction, uh, the, the influence from the EU? Because they can provide the region with something that the EU has not been able to, uh, to provide so far. First, energy security. Russia and Turkey are key in this uh, sense. Uh, then inf inf investment in infrastructure, unlike in other EU, in, uh, in EU member states where uh, EU funds, structural funds are quite uh, big for infrastructure in, uh, I would say, underdeveloped regions of the EU. Uh, there are practically no, in no investments until now. There will be something now in the Western Balkan infrastructure, which is very poor uh, from the EU. China jumped in several years ago and China is now, you know, engaged in many things, uh, uh, highways, uh, railways, um, et cetera, et cetera, and buying uh, firms, et cetera. But uh, very importantly, not about, this is not a story about China, but about Russia and Turkey. They actually count on the, uh, they, they uh, knock on the door of the Western Balkans, reminding uh, people that uh, they share identity and the same values with some of the Western Balkans uh, ethnic and religious groups. So Russia is counting on Orthodox Christians, Serbs first, uh, in, and uh, is trying to uh, 
uh, how to say, intensify relations because of the same uh, religious orientation. And Turkey is doing the same with, uh, with Muslims in the Western Balkans. But let us go down a little, please. Uh, these three and other uh, external uh, EU competitors have serious weaknesses. Uh, we, uh, the first one is Western Balkans is far away from them. It's not important, really. It's not one of their priorities. So they can exit the region very easily uh, without any problems. Secondly, uh, if once uh, the region or the, the countries of the region become EU members, they will have actually to cut uh strong ties for, uh, with uh, russia china turkey for example several countries few countries from the region have um, free trade agreements with turkey uh serbia had the one uh, a very strong and important one for serbia until last year and then it was transformed into a uh, free trade agreement between Serbia and Eurasian Economic uh, Union. So Russia led EU, Eastern EU. Um, on on, on the, the third place, I say that um, one weakness actually is if they are really not EU uh, uh, Western Balkan partners and friends, but spoilers like Russia is actually acting in, in the Western Balkans, trying to prevent further NATO uh, enlargement and trying to reduce the strength and popularity of the EU. It is quite successful, and this is quite a cheap, actually, uh, endeavor by Russia. Unlike the EU, one of the weaknesses of, of theirs, they can hardly be real uh, role models. They're, all three of them are actually variants of non-democratic regimes. Last but not least, there is a very obvious reduced soft power when we compare uh, the EU and, and these three, uh, they are terra incognita uh, for, for Western Balkan uh, population. Nobody knows except for Turkey anything about Russia, anything about China. Um, nobody speaks the languages actually also, including Turkish in, in the Western Balkans. Uh, and they're much more contacts, human ones, technological ones through uh, immigration, uh, and uh, through uh, media, all kinds of uh, organizations, including political ones and NGOs, between the Western Balkan uh, uh, counterparts and the EU. Okay, let's go. We are going towards the end. Let's see the next slide, please. But if you compare, you, and this is reality, you know, so there are now... Uh, hundreds of books and articles about the influence, the rising influence of Russia, China, and Turkey in the Western Balkans. When you see the reality, and this is the reality, you can see it on this picture, you see actually that the, when it comes to trade, to biggest trade partners of the, of the Western Balkan countries, it's the EU without any competition. See, almost 70% <coughs> of trade uh, is done uh, with the EU. And what is very important, actually, uh, the, it, when we say EU, these are mainly Germany and Italy. And uh, to say something nice about the Western Balkans, finally, after more than an hour, we export actually uh, not uh, wood or, you know, unprepared. Uh, we, we, we export good quality product now, to, especially to Germany and to Italy. When you see... Uh, the uh, competitors uh, share in uh, in, uh, in uh, trade partnership. You see, China is at eight percent, Turkey is at five percent, Ru Russia four percent, etc. Russia is there uh, with four percent because we uh, import um, oil and gas from Russia. Otherwise, it would have been even this would have been even a smaller number. Let's go down. So, uh, one of the questions asked in, in, in the last years is, so, uh, the EU people, the experts are asking uh, themselves and also us, would it be expensive for the EU to, to let us in? Yes, we would make problems, maybe. But in fact, now uh, the, the, the figures are uh, 
here. Uh, the eventual, the hypothetical accession of all uh, Western Balkan six would bring seven times more money from the EU funds in comparison with the help, with the economic financial aid we are getting at this moment, and we are getting something. For example, Serbia gets 200 million euros uh, of grants, so the money doesn't have to, to give back. The estimated costs for, for uh, EU member states are between, and this is incredible, between 0 0.014 and 0.026% of member states' general national income, which translates into uh, between 1.6 and 10.8 uh, euros per capita per year. So every single EU citizen would have to pay if, if the EU would take us in between 2 and, and 11 uh, euros. It is you who should say, is it too expensive or, or not? But uh, the, the, the gap between the EU countries, and this is practically the last thing I would say, uh, will continue to grow. Let's go to the next page. Because of the uh, recently, okay, planned um, financial in, in, uh, injections by the EU. So, on the right side and also on the left side, you have uh, that they put together the money from the budget that all these countries that you can see here will get first from the budget and second from the so-called recovery fund, COVID-related recovery fund. Uh, if you see the picture on the left, you see that uh, with uh, increase of Western Balkan funds, there, there is increase uh, in the EU, uh, we shall get per capita uh, 500 euros in the whole region, in all countries, 500 per capita. Take a look at Greece down to the south. I can't see now, uh, but I think it's near 5,700 uh, euros per capita. This is the calculation for the for the next uh, budget period, 2021, 2027. 20, At the same time, uh, I can't see here, uh, Croatia will get, I think, 3,000 something plus. Um, yes, uh, Bulgaria, 3,000 per capita, by the way. 700 and so on and so on. So you see that the existing differences in economic strength and economic aid by the EU will just get bigger in, in the years to come. Okay, let's go down now. I will not uh, comment this. This actually represents how different are economic conditions in the Western Balkans down here and in all other countries of the EU. I, I have to stop somewhere. Can we go go move forward, please? You will, I, I hope, uh, have uh, uh, this presentation available. Thank you. L let's stop here. So, in addition to economic problems that will prevent efficient and, uh, and, uh, recent and soon uh, accession of the, of the uh, Western Balkan countries, the backsliding in democracy and the rule of law areas throughout the region is equally the same uh, enemy or the, or the problem. And you see here, uh, so all countries of the Western Balkan region remain in the partly free category uh, as defined by the Freedom House in, in, in their Freedom in the World report from this year or in, in another report that I'm sure you are familiar with in Nations in Transit all Western Balkan countries are now transitional governments or hybrid regimes. So, in other words, they are not full democracies. And as you can see here, I, I don't have time to comment. Unfortunately, some EU member states like Hungary actually joined Serbia and Montenegro in this uh, transitional government uh, classification. Let's go to the last slide, please. Yes, actually, the last slide, the, the, yes. So, my conclusion is very simple. Western Balkan EU accession will be very difficult and, and I'm confident impossible in the near future. Maybe not impossible altogether. The image of the EU already worsened in comparison with a decade ago can hardly improve in this context. So, it will re remain bad or it might get worse. Now, the joke for the end. 
at least some of us, and you will see who from the region seem to have adopted good manners comparable to the ones from the EU. We all know that people in the EU are very well mannered and nice. Can you please uh, press this uh, and then open it and uh, enlarge uh, the picture and let, let us hear the sound? Uh, it should work. Can you yes, try it again? works, but ju just a second because uh, yeah. uh, we have to. No? You will see two two kind men. One is Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte, and the other is Albanian Prime Minister Edi Rama, who are so nice that every each of them actually is trying to uh, how to say it, uh, to convince the other to get into the the conference room first. But it's a very funny situation, which I think should we should remember it as a way, you know, uh, as something that presents the Balkan people, the Balkan leaders, in a very positive sense. Huh? I think it's enough if you just press the, 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 the link. This is what I did. Just, uh-huh, enlarge it, please, and move it a little up. Go up. Uh, yes, and then, then uh, uh, write down, there is, no, oh, no, 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 write down on, on the image. Okay. okay, so to the right, Mark Rutte, uh, Dutch Prime Minister, to the left, Edi Rama, Albanian Prime Minister. So they should enter the conference room now. No, Mark Rutte is leading the You go first. No, you go first. No, 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 I won't allow that. So they go backwards. Can you imagine? This is one of the funniest things I've seen from these stupid conferences. So la finally, Western Balkans win, and Eddie Rama lets Mark Rutte go first. But the point is, we are not that bad, actually. Okay, thank you. That's all for me. I'm ready to answer the question. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry for for the too long presentation. Okay, so thank you very much, Jovan. And, and now the floor is open to your comments and your, your questions and so on. As usual, you can use the chat, you can turn on your mic and so on and so forth. Okay, so let's see whether there are any comments or, or from here from, from, from the class or, or from the chat. Uh, the, first, uh, um, the first question is mine as usual and it has to do with the, the attitudes of the Western Balkan population towards, not just towards uh, uh, accession to the EU as such, but towards uh, the measures suggested, proposed, imposed by the European Union to implement uh, the so-called Copenhagen criteria. That is, for example, let's take uh, the economic measures, the economic measures. So I, I know that uh, um, there were, I don't know whether uh, there still are uh, move, grassroots uh, movements in, in, uh, in Bosnia, for example, protesting or against the European Union and against the economic measures, which means uh, liberalization and so on, uh, imposed uh, over Bosnia. So, um, it is true or not? So, what is the attitude towards what the European Union imposes or proposes uh, to the region? In order to in order to access into the EU. Yes. First of all, generally speaking, economic measures are not that much of a problem for the population or for experts or for governments. Because <clears throat> as I said, the EU has been helping, you know. And there is a, a special fund for the Western Balkans and Turkey, around 12 billion euros for the uh, for the budget period, 21-27. Uh, and they give uh, some uh, quite a lot of funds actually, which they, the countries don't have to, to pay back. So these are grants, not credits. So this is okay. And there are many good examples of cooperation. Uh, so what uh, the governments are now afraid that actually the new era in, in uh, the EU treating non-democracies is coming. 
because during the last two years, there have been uh, many battles within the EU, <clears throat> according to which, uh, well, the, the, the result of which is what most of the EU member states wanted, is that uh, there is now, or there should be, there will be a connection between democratic uh, uh, results uh, and, uh, and uh, availability of funds from the EU. Poland and Hungary, or Hungary and Poland, uh, opposed this mostly because they were afraid that uh, they would be, uh, they would get less money uh, from the EU because of their lack of democracy and lack of, of the rule of law. This is something that is going to affect Western Balkan countries and their and the economic um, uh, cooperation or help from the EU. This is something that is going to be very serious. It hasn't begun yet. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> on, on the other side, and this is a part of the same question or my answer, uh, there are many uh, new proposals during the last two years or so about the uh, improvement of relations uh, or uh, the improvement of the accession process for the Western Balkans. Two main things are important. One, uh, most uh, experts uh, and also the, the, the French side, uh, France had a, a non-paper a uh, year and a half, two years ago, about that, and it, it influenced the debate very much. And they say, actually, most uh, participants in this debate say that, uh, uh, that the EU accession process should be changed. And there was a formal change in February of 2020, uh, Commission, European Commission actually introduced new methodology actually in uh, in accession for for accession of, of the Western Balkans that actually now uh, divides 34 or 35 uh, chapters that are to be negotiated with, between two sides into several six now clusters groups of questions that are to be negotiated. And this has just started, and uh, the first cluster is uh, also about uh, the most important and, uh, and the most problematic thing, the rule of law and democracy. Uh, the idea behind these actions is actually that uh, the Western Balkan countries should uh, follow the examples of um, some other Western European countries when joining the EU to get to the single market first, including good government, good governance and, and uh, good uh, democracy, and to be uh, somehow uh, rewarded for that. This would, so, uh, in other words, for the first, once the first chapter is done, there, uh, the, uh, uh, the help from the EU will increase. And this is how to say, <laughs> there's high expectations among the public, and there is fear among the governments. And then comes the second cluster or the second stage of accession. So this, the, the change now means that the accession would be done in phases. And every time a phase is finished, uh, we become, the Western Balkan countries become more uh, real uh, members of the EU with final, you know, a declaration once we pass all, all this. So we don't wait for 30 years for the accession negotiations to end, but uh, the the states and the population, the governments feel uh, the, the, the results of their efforts uh, every couple of years, you know, and, and, you know, we are more and more part of the EU. Okay, so thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Johan. There is a question from Ilaria. Ilaria, where are you? Are you here or, or, or where are you? <coughs> uh, so she's connected from somewhere. So uh, can you turn on your camera or your mic and read the question? Or do you want me to read it? Or Ilaria, just just wait two or three seconds. Just turn on the lights here. Sorry. <laughs> So uh, I don't know where Ilaria is. Maybe Johan, you can see. Can can you see the um, can you see the question there on the chat or not? Uh, there was on the chat. Yes, there, there were some. 
Ah, yes, I see. So do you think do you think that the new secessionist tendencies in Bosnia with leaders like Milor and Dodik could actually lead to the secession of some areas and to a new conflict? And could the entrance of Bosnia in the EU pacify the ethnic tensions in the region? Yes, uh, the situation is extremely dangerous. So Dodik and his supporters, among others, very importantly, the Serbian president behind the scene, so he doesn't want to say this openly. They are trying actually to, <coughs> I would say, to debilitate the, the state of Bosnia, make it more vulnerable, in the same way in which Russia is, has been trying actually to do a very similar thing with Ukraine, for example. Um, and uh, now the, the ethnic conflicts are rising and they're on very high level. Uh, uh, Dodik uh, has, pro has promised that actually there are also legal acts uh, about this uh, in, in Republika Srpska, the Serbian ethnic team in Bosnia, that actually uh, the representatives of this entity will not uh, participate in the, in the common institutions at the level of the state of Bosnia. He is retreating, particularly, you know, asking openly for secession and practically for unification with Serbia, which would change completely. But this is also good for, uh, and never mentioned openly in Serbia. Uh, the, uh, the untold story in Serbia is that Serbia is losing Kosovo that will have to, you know, become a fully full state and also the state recognized by Serbia. And while it cannot, while Serbia cannot prevent Kosovo to become a normal state, uh, one of the ways, one compensation for that would be the reunification with half of Bosnia. So it's very, very dangerous. It's an international representative. Uh, I think it's time for the EU uh, part. Dodik is going. To, he's I think what is being prepared and what should be prepared is actually higher pressure on, on him and on all other actors uh, in Bosnia that are in, in one way or another, especially the Croat factor is helping what and is one, wanting the same as Dodik. Uh, and also the, the pressure is, is uh, needed on, on Serbia and on Croatia you know, because they, they are complex somehow you know part of the problem not of the solution so far so uh so, and yes the eu should react to that okay uh, it's you know it, it, this is a very strange way how the you know you have to respect sovereignty of a country but uh, uh you know in, uh, there must be a way uh taking funds out is not popular and that could actually uh, lead to much bigger problems and to what Giovanni mentioned to some, uh, how to say, resentment among the population. Let us move to the next question. Hey, there is a question from Joel. You are here in class, right? Can you use your... Come on, come on. <laughs> yes. So... Okay. Uh, are you ready? In, in I see you. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, about. No, are you uh, using also, your, your? Okay. See, okay. See. Uh, about uh, the last threat of succession in Bosnia, uh, they already asked, yes, but uh, what should be the uh, EU reaction to it? What is the threat uh, to EU about uh, uh, this possibility of secession, not only for Bosnia but? Uh, because of uh, the uh, uh, the competition uh, in um, the competition of Russia and uh, Turkey in uh, the area. Yeah. Okay. So, um, the, okay. So uh, there are three questions. No, we can collect okay. them. So, yes, I, I answered partly the, the Bosnian question. I can't say, you know, exactly what should be done. And uh, by the lack of chance on the part of the EU, you can see that this is so difficult a question that the EU has no idea what to do also. Uh, but the, this is a crucial moment and uh, 
the older people like me, you know, we compare this moment in Bosnia with the one uh, before the beginning, you know, on the eve of the war in Bosnia, which was April 92. Things are, you know, not quite different, but uh, I don't think there will be another war. It will be disastrous for all uh, for all nations, for all, uh, and also for all politicians. But uh, it, it, uh, delaying the, the reaction from the EU would make things worse. Okay, let's go for the next one. Okay, Vasily is connected from Moscow. So, Vasily, can you turn on your mic, turn mic and etc.? Okay, Vasily, yes, uh, please. Uh, uh, Hvala vam puno. Uh, okay, thank you, very, Professor, very, very much for your uh, lecture, for your presentation. It was very, very interesting and thought provocative. Well, my question is as follows From your perspective, will West, the Western Balkans or some Western Balkans countries end up uh, joining the European Union, given the example of Moldova, with which the EU has strong economic ties, but it hasn't accepted Kishinov with the bloc yet? Здравствуй, Vasily. Uh... Спасибо за ваш вопрос. I'm responding in the same way, so he used Serbo-Croatian, you know. Um, <clears throat> uh, actually, I, I kind of uh, answered this question. First of all, I, nobody knows, including me. I mean, even much more clever people than me. Uh, whether the Western Balkans will ever join. Um, so it's, uh, it's everybody's best. Uh, I, I was speaking about the, the problems and about also the, the long-term and the short-term and the long-term perspectives. So I think I'm sure that in the short-term and in the medium perspective, let's say in the next 10 years, there is no chance of, of getting in. Uh, the EU made, <laughs> uh, how to say, involuntary a mistake uh, in uh, several years ago uh, when they put the year to, uh, 2025 as the perspective year for Montenegro and Serbia to get in. And then everybody, you know, in, around uh, the neighbors reacted, why them and not us? Uh, so they, they now don't want to make the same mistake. And nobody wants to just see how the, uh, uh, the EU enlargement be much more, you know, uh, in in order for this to be, but as I said at the beginning, uh, the of Moldova, the eastern neighbors you know, uh, of Moldova, uh, Belarus, that's out of the question, but even, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Ukraine or Georgia, uh, so the, the closest one uh, to the EU from all the, the ex Soviet states, it is, uh, it cannot be compared with the Western Balkans because. These states have never been promised uh, membership, and we have a stamp from <laughs> from the document from 2003 that once we meet the conditions, uh, we'll get in. And there was a phrase in 2003 by, and I am glad to say that by Romano Prodi, who was uh, the president of the European, European Commission at that time, that the phrase for this document was. Uh, Europe will not be complete without Western Balkan countries. Grazie, Romano. Uh, so this is my, my answer. Thank you. Thank you. There is uh, a question from Clementine here in the class. Can you, can you use your... Yes. Okay, <clears throat> just a second, Jovan. Are you ready? Yes, please go. Loudly, loudly. I can't hear anything, huh? Can you? You you cannot hear. No. No. Is this the question? Can you explain? Okay. And now no, this is... the, yeah. Can you try again? Otherwise. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay. So my question is about uh, the Serbians' neutrality. I think you mentioned it during your um, presentation. Yeah. And uh, I'm not sure I understood well. So, what's uh, the relationship now uh, between Serbia and Russia, and what's the advantages of uh, such Serbian neutrality for Russia? 
Okay. The, the advantage is, uh, as I said, uh, to prevent further to prevent further NATO enlargement in Europe. This is priority number one in Russia's foreign policy. There is nothing more important. So this is why they react. Russia reacts so. Uh, enthusiastically uh, and emotionally about any move actually that could uh, somehow put the, the the borders of NATO nearer to Russia. That's why the, the fight about around Ukraine. But um, the, uh, the decision, and I said it was done improperly in legal terms by Serbia to turn neutral, this was done in December 2007. Three months before Kosovo decided unilaterally, again, this is something legally uh, very suspicious and, and not allowed, uh, not, not according to the international law. So the uh, Kosovo decided in its, its assembly, the parliament decided February, three months after this Serbian decision to get uh, independent. Serbia realized three months before, in December 2007, that it could not prevent Kosovo becoming an independent state. And it wanted, under the, the then uh, uh, Prime Minister, who was uh, very critical of Kosovo independence, it wanted to do something uh, in favor of, of Russia, actually. Uh, so, to turn Serbia neutral and to put it uh, very explicitly against NATO. Or maybe future NATO NATO members. At the same time, uh, I mean, this uh, this thing was done in, uh, in, in, as, a, as a favor to Russia because uh, Serbia was expecting expecting Russia to be very active within the UN Security Council in preventing Kosovo becoming a UN member, and Russia has done that. So Kosovo has not become a UN member ever since for the last for 13 years after their unilateral declaration of independence uh, in in addition actually serbia wanted to to do another favor to russia so it sold its um, its monopoly a uh, firm uh, on on oil and gas very cheaply to russia uh, trying also to to uh, uh, take care of its own Serbia's energy security, of course, in in future. And uh, this move was greatly appreciated by by Russia. So uh, this that uh, Serbia turned neutral in a uh, few years before that, maybe in two thousand and five. Russia had a, a strange and never realized idea about the so-called four N in the Balkans or in the Western Balkans. And meaning uh, there should be four neutral countries in the Balkans Serbia, Macedonia, Bosnia, and Montenegro. But all dreams about that uh, became untrue. And as we said, Montenegro uh, became closer and, and then finished in 2017 as a member of NATO. On crucial elections uh, in, uh, a year before that, uh, Russia tried, according to many uh how to say observers this was never proved but there was a court case in montenegro russia tried to make or help a coup in montenegro to prevent montenegro becoming nato so this is this shows you how important this issue is for russia so this failed uh, last sentence is that i will probably say now uh, in this lecture is about a very strange relationship between serbia and russia so officially, you know, we have the best of relations. Uh, Serbia is not only have, does not only have free trade agreement with first Russia and now with Russian EU, so Eurasian Economic uh, Organization. Serbia has been from 2013 also uh, a, an observer in the so-called Collective Security Treaty Organization, so Russia's NATO, Russia's uh, military bloc. So. Serbia and Afghanistan <laughs> are uh, observers in that organization. Serbia has many uh, military ties and buys quite a lot of uh, military equipment from, uh, from Russia, also from China. Uh, 
but we also buy many, many, a lot of military equipment from NATO. And if now there is quite a lot of how to say smoke, you know, in these relationships. If you go behind the scenes, you will see that Serbia has more military exercises with NATO as as part of the so-called PF uh, Partnership for Peace (PFP). Uh, this is a, a nursery school for NATO. Uh, more with NATO than with with Russia. And actually, uh, the, the uh, relations with NATO are very, very good because, among other things, NATO is in Kosovo with its troops, with the boots on, uh, on the ground. And these people, these soldiers, uh, they take care of the uh, Serbs that are in very bad position, actually, in, in Kosovo. Last but not least, so uh, in all uh, public speeches and private speeches, you will see, you will hear praises about Russia. Brothers in uh, arms, brothers in religion, etc. Once you ask uh, Serbian population, do you or Serbian people, do you want to live in Russia, work in Russia, or do you want your children to live and work in Russia? No, no, no. So I want to live. This is the, you know, uh, most people, uh, a majority says, no, I don't want to live in Russia. I want to live, love Russia from distance, you know. So that's, you know, a very strange kind of, of attitude. It's a myth. So these uh, psychological, spiritual uh, linkages between Russia and Serbia, they are tested, you know, when you ask people, are you going to... Now, whether you want to, to take Russian vaccine, you know. Yes, I would like because it has some specificities. Uh, but uh, you know, now for the vaccine, most people choose Pfizer. They hate America, but they hate America where they would like to live, and they love Russia where they would like to live. So yes, it, it's complicated, but this is how to say uh, a mix or or a confusion in in the heads of many many people in uh, in Serbia. Thank you.